All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to our panel, New Tech Enhancing Web3. I'm curious for all of our panelists, but also all of the audience, who flew in here today? Who's, who's coming in today? Yeah? Me too, super tired. Who came yesterday? Yeah, you guys still jet lagged? Yeah, so-so? How about you guys? Sunday. Sunday? Sunday, just before Monday. <laughs> yeah, Sunday night. Sunday? Wednesday. Oh, so I wow. have a lot of time to relax. Okay, okay, cool. So, welcome. My name is Jules. I will be moderating this panel. I come from Sahara AI. We are a decentralized AI blockchain platform built for a open, equitable, and collaborative uh, AI economy. I would like each of you to introduce yourselves. So we can start closest to me. Tell me a little about, about yourself as well as your project. All right. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Yannick, co-founder and CEO at Archeum. Um, what we're doing at Archeum is we're building a decentralized confidential computing network to allow for anything to be computed over encrypted data without having to decrypt the data first. Um, my background is in computer science and mathematics. Um, actually, before studying computer science and mathematics, I studied law. So. Um, yeah, my angle always has been sort of this um, multifaceted um, background of looking at things both from a mathematical standpoint, but also being quite critical of, of some developments in the space, maybe from a legal and compliance standpoint. Um, yeah, and our team is a team of um, cryptography and machine learning researchers. Um, we are now six PhDs in our team um, and yeah, are just building cryptography. Yeah, hi, I'm Ron, co-founder of Theoric. Uh, my background, I've been an entrepreneur most of my career, working in the AI space for over a decade, whether it was Quantcast that was a pioneer in AI and ad tech, or then starting Think Big Analytics and selling it to Teradata, uh, where I ended up as VP and GM of AI. I was in the CTO office at Google Cloud, responsible for applied AI, and you know, uh, went on to Vectrum Institute, which is leading research institute in Canada for AI. Uh, me and the, the founding team are AI veterans who really felt that there was such an opportunity, but also such an urgent need in the AI space to move away from the web two way, to move away from a world where a few billionaires are going to control something as transformative and critical for the future as AI. Um, so we felt that the ideals of web three and community ownership uh, along with the ability to really build something open that was a public utility, was a big opportunity and need. Um, so at the Oric, we're laser focused on an AI agent uh, platform, an uh, ecosystem, a blockchain where it's easy for ag specialized agents to collaborate. And just to give a little background, AI agents are uh, specialized software that increasingly is autonomous, that uses large language models and data and tools like running code to do things. And we think the future is agentic where there's going to be specialized agents working together. So excited to be here today and talk more about that vision and, and how it fits together the future of blockchain. Hey everyone, super excited to be here. Michael, co-founder and CEO of Zero Gravity, also known as Zero G. Um, my background is I started on the engineering and technical product management side at Microsoft and then switched over more to the business side, worked for a Bain & Company for a couple of years, uh, then moved into finance and worked for Bridgewater Associates. After that, went back to grad school at Stanford, started my first Web2 company that became a top Y Combinator and unicorn company. I left that to start Zero G with uh, three other brilliant co-founders, multiple Olympic gold informatics medalists and uh, MIT PhDs and Microsoft research veterans. And essentially what we do at Zero G is we're building the fastest modular AI chain. So we're essentially developing all of the infrastructure necessary to put AI fully on chain. And we started at the data infrastructure level with storage for AI workloads, very fast data ingestion and retrieval rates. Then we built a data availability layer on top of that so you can have bandwidth of 50 gigabytes per second, which is a million times faster than Ethereum. Um, and then we are now building a serving framework so that you can register as serving nodes and get inference fine tuning through other providers. So we really want to become the glue that brings all the different kind of Web3 projects together and collaborate on the Web3 AI space so that we can make AI a public good. 
Hi everyone, this is Jasper, CEO and co-founder of Hyperbolic. I did my math PhD at UC Berkeley, finishing two years, which makes me the fastest person to finish a PhD in the history of Berkeley when I was 24 years old. And also give me the idea of the name of my future company, Hyperbolic, because I was doing topology and hyperbolic geometry. Uh, before that, I did my undergrad at Peking University, graduated with the highest honor soon after a year, and also won a few gold medals in different mathematical competitions. Uh, I have worked at Everlabs and Citadel Securities before I founded Hyperbolic Labs. Um, so I, at Hyperbolic Labs, uh, we're building a decentralized AI cloud to enable open access to AI. Uh, we think AI is the most powerful tools known to the mankind. And in the future, AI will be integrated with the most powerful AI systems like uh, transportation, social media, finance, uh, robotics, and even your brains. Um, so in the centralized setting, there's no way for you to be able to control this powerful ad advanced technology, and neither can you to participate in this revenue sharing opp opportunities. So uh, what we believe is that we want to partner with all these Web3 AI projects to build an open AI ecosystem and economy of the people, by the people, for the people, where AI infrastructure, services, and models are accessible on contributed and benefit all of you. Um, and at Hyperbolic, we specialize on building the infrastructure level uh, technology. So we're building decentralized orchestration layer to aggregate global GPUs. And we're also building AI services layer to maximize the performance of different kinds of GPUs. We're also working on verification. Uh, we invented a new verification mechanism called proof of sampling to verify the correctness of the results, even if it's generated by a random third party node. And we were also working with partners together to solve the privacy problems. Nice. We have a really accomplished group of panels, panelists. I'm, I'm really excited to hear from you. I want to know, AI has become such a buzzword lately. And I've seen so many projects opening up and so many people that want to talk to us about their interest in AI. Right? They're just, hey, AI is this big thing. And I want to build something in AI. But they don't have any idea on what to build. I'm interested to understand what you all think the intersection of crypto and AI is. Does AI need crypto, or does crypto need? Uh, does AI need crypto? Does crypto need AI? What are your thoughts? Um, yes, both need each other. It's <laughs> the short answer. Um, why does uh, AI need crypto? So I usually distinguish between kind of personal use cases on one hand and then societal level use cases on another hand. So if you have a personal agent that's ordering a pizza for you or making a restaurant reservation, not as important from a crypto perspective, maybe you pay in stable coins or whatever, but on societal use cases, that's where I think the danger lies. So basically you've got this whole closed AI system and open AI ironically is closed AI because you have no idea where the data came from, what the censorship was, what version of the model you're being served and all of those different you know, weights and biases and so on. Um, and then you have decentralized AI, which we're all building towards, where you can independently verify what you're actually getting, which version of the model you're running, what the data provenance was, and so on. And so if you have these societal level use cases, like logistic systems, administrative systems, governmental systems, that eventually can be automated. So let's take a very simple use case like trash collection. You've got an agent that does all the trash collection in Singapore, and let's say it's a centralized agent, that centralized agent one day can decide, you know what, I'm hyper smart, I'm gonna break into the database, change all the entries, create a bunch of Gen AI images saying I did all this work and I can get my reward. So that agent's essentially cheating. So with crypto, we can essentially change all of that. We can first of all know everything that went into training of that model, where the data came from, how it was cleaned, you know, how it was labeled, what the censorship pieces are. We can determine what the censorship pieces are. Then we can give specific uh, observer rights and verification rights to say, okay, is this model actually cheating? Is it cheating? Okay, let's slash those conditions. So then you can essentially ensure that these models and agents are fully aligned with the human values that we have. And so for these societal big level use cases in the next 10 to 20 years, when you have you know, humanoid robots with AI agents in them doing things in the physical world, absolutely AI depends on blockchains in the future. And so very much uh, pro the intersection of Web3 and AI.
I think those are all good points. And I, I'd build on it further that, you know, as we get, like, we, we passionately believe that the future is agentic, that you will have many specialized agents collaborating. And what becomes incredibly important there is to have reputation and to have a way that you actually have pro-social dynamics so that good agents uh, succeed, that you don't win by being a bad actor, by behaving badly, right? So it's incredibly important to have community governance and mechanisms that creates a race to a top so that you get uh, agents that are well-behaved and work well together. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes people might say, oh, that's, uh, isn't that just doing whatever uh, the person, you know, who asked the agent to do something wants? That's really not it, right? That's one of the things that's beautiful about Web3 is that we talk about communities and all the stakeholders and not just users and, and what does a user want or, you know, what does a monopolist, an extractive monopolist want, right? So I think we really do need for society, for the future of AI, we desperately need Web3 so that you have governance that will produce good outcomes and do drive a race to the top for good AI agents. You know, I think it's also needless to say that Web3 needs AI in the sense that uh, in order to be competitive and effective, this technology is so transformative um, that, you know, to solve usability, to really create high value use cases based on Web3, you have to have deep integration of AI. Um, and the last thing is, uh, I think it's incredibly important that as AI agents become more and more important, they can't be unbanked, right? They need to have assets as well as reputation. They need to control and spend and, and have an economy. And blockchain is perfect. It's designed for digital assets, for digital exchanges, even you know the ownership of agents themselves as NFTs. So the two really do fit together. But I'm, I'm convinced that um, AI agent reputation is the killer app for blockchain. Um, what what personally drives me is really always um, this notion of attempting to not land in a dystopian future. And so um, the way I think about it really is that um, a dystopian future um, can be caused by some centralized um, human-based entity controlling everything or as well some centralized um, AI-based entity um, controlling everything. So I think um, the answer in both cases is distribution and decentralization. Um, and if we think about control, what control means is that um, it means ownership, ownership of, of assets in the traditional blockchain sp uh, sense, but also now more increasingly with, with the advent of artificial intelligence, ownership of data and ownership of models. And so the way I like to think about uh, not dystopian future is having end-to-end -end encrypted artificial intelligence. And that means that the training, um, the data that is being used for, for training new models um, is owned by individuals and organizations and is transparently um, and verifiably being used in training pipelines. And at the same time, those resulting models can be fully public or can be fully encrypted. Um, and then inference into those models, using those models for agents or just as we use uh, ChatGPT on a day-to-day -day basis, um, also remains private. Um, so the data from both ends, training and inference, um, remains fully encrypted. And I think that's that's a highly important aspect, um, both on an individual, but more importantly than on a societal level, because I think free decision making in a society is only possible if the individual is free, and the individual can only be free if it has um, ownership over their personal data. So yeah, my point uh, kind of echo with what they said. Like I think the major um, usage of AI and Web3, uh, the inter intersection will be like, First, transparency of AI, which is more related to using blockchain and verifiability uh, mechanism to make sure that all the process is uh, transparent. And second is like uh, monetization and revenue sharing, which is like tokenizing access, including GPUs, AI models, et cetera, to let people to be able to participate. Uh, so first, for the verification part, Michael already talked a lot about that. And I want to mention that like um, we, we kind of have this idea of building the proof of intelligence, uh, which means that the in the AI pipeline, you will start with data collection, data labeling, and then you will uh, gathering the compute, 
you will also try to train the model, and then you will try to serve model on AI inference service. Uh, so each of these step require transparency and verification, um, which can, uh, a lot of people have proposed many different ways, and I think um, our proof of sampling mechanism can also be very helpful to solve this problem. And then second, uh, for the revenue sharing part, um, like a lot of people have the ideas of tokenizing the access, because right now, if as an AI developer, if I really want to build an AI model, uh, I first need to come up with the idea, and then I need to pitch to investors uh, to try to uh, raise like hundreds of millions of dollars to have the enough capital and compute, uh, and enough engineers to really change the models. Um, however, if we can actually leverage uh, blockchain to tokenize the future revenue uh, future revenue sharing of the AI models and allow the AI developers to issue the tokens and raise the monies from uh, the token buyers first uh, before really think about the monetization of the AI models. And later, uh, once he actually changed the model and holds the model on uh, the de decentralized infrastructure, he can later on think about how to monetize it. So basically, we try to, uh, by using blockchain, we can reverse the order of building an AI model, which allow developers to focus more on actually building the model instead of raising the money, and that can, uh, hand, uh, like, therefore we can in, uh, accelerate the process to um, accelerating the, the AI model development. Awesome, lots of support for decentralized AI, which I am not surprised <laughs> considering we are at a blockchain conference. I am curious, and I'm told I need to give a, uh, try to get some hot takes from you guys or else you're gonna be forced to eat these chili peppers. So on the topic of decentralized AI and decentralization in general, I think a lot of people think of decentralization uh, as this very binary thing, you either are or you aren't decentralized. But uh, if you've been in this space for a while, you know that it's more of a spectrum. It's something that you're constantly trying to get to. When it comes to AI and we're seeing all of, you know, a lot of compute and storage kind of being done off-chain because a lot of the on-chain ways that we could do that aren't really there yet. What are your opinions on AI decentralization? Like how far does it need to go for us to be done? Does everything need to be completely decentralized and on-chain? I mean, uh, yes, if you want it to be fully censorship resistant, if you want it to be community owned, if you want to have provenance, then yes. But in a centralized world, it works fine, but you have to trust different entities. So it depends on what you're trying to do. So in a decentralized setting, um, if we just start at the data layer where we started, most decentralized AI companies are storing their model where? AWS. <laughs> so that needs to change if you want to have full kind of censorship resistance because one day AWS might say, you're, um, you know, we have terms of service, you're breaking them, therefore we're going to remove your model from our servers. You have to now use, I don't know, SageMaker or something like that to create the model. Um, that shouldn't happen in a decentralized way. You want your models to actually be available. And so at the data level, which means you then have to have multiple copies and some sense of an index that's then stored on the blockchain to actually see how to retrieve these different pieces very, very rapidly. And then even from a decentralized training part, you need then the data pipeline to even make that available. So, you know, InfiniBand does about anywhere from 40 to 400 gigabytes per second in throughput. Ethereum does about 80 kilobytes per second in throughput. So can't really run uh, large-scale model training on Ethereum. So you have to have a very different mechanism. And so we also built that. So there's a lot of these infrastructure pieces that need to be in place first before it actually can become a reality that there's a full decentralized AI stack that works for that purpose. I mean, I, I don't believe that we're going to have fully decentralized AI. Um, let's start with the hardware. Where's the project to build decentralized GPUs that are designed in an open source manner and, can, and manufactured in an open manner, right? How about storage? You know, like all of these far fundamental hardware pieces that we're building on are controlled by centralized oligopolies and there's no movement to replace them. So there's gonna be centralization somewhere in the supply chain. I think it's a little bit, uh, more important to sort of focus on like where are the leverage points, where are the points where um, you've got uh, 
centralization that's creating problems, right? If you've got a healthy market where you've got um, relative commodity suppliers that are offering different things, that's probably a lot less risky than powerful monopolies that have proprietary architectures and start using that to enforce their will, right, to extract value. So I think, you know, I totally agree with the premise of the question that you have to sort of start with where where is the most leverage? I also think, you know, there's a, a conflation there. Saying something on-chain and decentralized are very different things. Blockchain is one decentralization technology. It's a very high overhead decentralization technology. So it's really good for some things. It's great at preventing double spend. But there's a lot of other places and other trade-offs for doing decentralization. So I, I also don't think we should somehow acquaint that everything needs to be on-chain in order to be decentralized or sufficiently decentralized. And failing that, like the other thing I'll point out is at, in the model layer, a lot of people are excited about open weight models, right? Like, you know, uh, Llama 3.1 is a very popular series of m open weight models. I don't call them open source. They're not open source, right? We don't know the, the way they were trained. We don't know what data they were trained on. There's, a, you know, it's, there's been good research showing that you can have Trojan horses trained into those weights and you wouldn't know. There's lots of reason to not view that as truly open. The thing is, it's very challenging, you know, in a world where we're moving to multi-billion dollar models to fully decentralize training them. But, you know, that doesn't mean we should, as a community should give up. We should instead find ways to create the maximum community ownership and minimize the risk of a single monopolist controlling the foundational models. Since uh, uh, this is supposed to be spicy, <laughs> I'll agree to disagree, at least on the, um, let's start with the hardware layer. So think of like TEML, right? Very little overhead compared to centralized solutions, 30% or so. The issue is you have to trust a hardware manufacturer. What if the US government puts a back door into those devices? Um, you know, you can then break it. So we do still need some element of decentralization on the hardware side. So maybe there's open source community that builds their own hardware and so on. Um, by the way, I, I don't think we absolutely need to do this just yet, but I think there is a case where we do need to do this so that we can protect against these types of trust assumptions. Um, and then you've got to replace TSMC and all their tool suppliers too. It's, yeah, I mean, it's not saying that it's easy, but uh, may, we may have to do it. Or you have multiple, you know, devices from different countries that are then installed, so not one of them can fail and not all of them have, like, backdoors and so on. Um, not a trivial problem, for sure. The other thing I'll um, point out is that, for example, with our data storage layer, we've done some experiments, and uh, actually Chris is in the audience who ran that experiment. Uh, we did uh, streaming data and did some fine-tuning with RAG on that streaming data. After about a few minutes, um, the centralized and decentralized solution, there was almost no loss. It was almost the same level of performance. So decentralized systems inherently don't need to be less performance than centralized systems. The one big difference, though, is latency. And so because you're running into physical constraints, like speed of light type of issues. So if you have a consensus system involved and you want to have an ultra low latency game, you know, kind of challenging. So one solution to do that then is to do like layer twos where you can then have, you know, like a centralized sequencer, uh, but the rest underlying infrastructure is still decentralized uh, from a settlement perspective. And then, uh, you know, you can go across those, but really they don't have to be at odds. Performance and decentralization don't have to be at odds. Yeah, I think that the question is actually about like whether decentralized need to be fully on chain. And I think like definitely not like I agree with Ron what said like uh, blockchain is just a way to decentralize things. It basically powered by consensus. I think it makes sense for like data layer to use consensus and all these like blockchain layer to store the data. But however, for the compute side, uh, we don't think consensus makes a lot of sense. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to run an AI model right now, if in a centralized solution, uh, you just need to use one machine to run the model. But however. If you want to bring that fully on chain, that it means like you need 1,000s or 100 nodes to repeat the competi competition and try to um, get the result based on the major uh, majority of the uh, the votes. Uh, this doesn't make sense because like it kind of increases a lot of uh, competition we had, at least for now, for try to solve the computational shortage. Um, there are also other ways to 
to uh, decentralization, right? Like uh, the trust we think is like uh, actually a special. You can be uh, have like consensus, and then you can also have zk proof, which is super super uh, secure because of uh, because the math doesn't lie, but uh, it only rely on just one machine to generate the proof. Uh, and then you can also do fraud proof, which is more based on the uh, economy side. Like you, you kind of allow people to challenge it, and if it is like wrong, then you will uh, uh, slash them with a certain amount of penalty. Um, and the way we think about what makes most sense is sampling based verification mechanism for computing, because in this way uh, you only need to verify a certain percentage of the whole results, and then uh, as long as uh, this, within this like probability, if there is like result is deemed wrong, then the node will be punished with a high level uh, of penalty. And in this way, we can also prove that uh, the system has uh, pure strategy Nash equilibrium, which means that everyone in the system will behave 100% honestly. Um, and I think that uh, it's not possible, uh, very likely we're not going to see uh, AI, uh, at least for the model hosting part and the training part, to be fully on chain. Um, and I, I, I would say like verification and trust will, is always heterogeneous and it's always a trade-off between uh, efficiency and security and we'll let uh, the public to choose whatever they want. Yeah, I think um, decentralization for decentralization's sake um, doesn't make any sense. It also has to be sustainable, right? So constructing artificially decentralized systems that in the long run um, will be centralized um, and cannot be sustained doesn't make any sense. Um, and um, at Archeum, what, what we're doing essentially is what you usually would call off-chain compute. Um, Archeum is its own network. It runs confidential computations using multi-party computation, so it requires decentralization and distribution on its own. Um, but the nodes within Archeum don't perform consensus. Um, instead, they communicate sometimes with existing blockchain ledgers and use them essentially for state and consensus management. Um, and the network on its own just communicates with each other and, and does those secure computations. So I think for us the focus is clear that um, computing off-chain can be done and um, can be verified on, on, a, on a distributed ledger then um, with, with the output being produced as a proof. Um, so I think in the context of, of artificial intelligence, um, what also has to be kept in mind is that, um, I think Ron, you, you touched on this, the competitive nature of distributed models, distributed um, approach and a centralized approach. And um, we need to build systems that can produce competitive or better um, protocols. And so I think that means on the training side of things that by having decentralization and this distribution, um, we are able to um, train models on more valuable, more high quality data if, for example, we utilize encrypted data. Um, I think we can have more valuable outputs being produced from, from inference if, for example, we are able to um, have open weights and on top of that maybe um, have explainable AI. Um, and so um, if responsibility is one of the key features of decentralized AI, um, I think that can make it more valuable. But in general, I would say that um, there always has to be some reason for decentralization and distribution. Um, and for me, that reason is security um, and trustlessness. Um, and Michael, you touched on that, um, backdoors and hardware. I think that's one of my major concerns. So um, I'm quite convinced that um, with advance in hardware acceleration um, and new cryptographic optimizations regarding network communication, um, we will be able to overcome the need for trusted execution environments, for example, and will be um, able to utilize the technology that we are building, sort of combination of homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation to run any kind of complex computation in a secure and encrypted manner. Um, and I think decentralization here makes sense, um, and then there's parts where decentralization makes no sense. Awesome. Some pretty hot takes. I thought there was going to be a fight here for a second. I was uh, getting excited. So. Maybe we With should continue. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's let's keep the hot takes going. So, 
kind of on the similar topic with how pervasive centralized AI is, how long until we see mass adoption of decentralized AI and what are your projects doing specifically to help us achieve that? I mean, I think, you know, to, to build on what we were talking about in the previous answer, like the, 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 the really critical place that, that I see the struggle being is like, are we going to allow the monopolists who are building the models to build the walled gardens and sort of take um, the future is agentic, right? We're going to have so many great agents that can transform the economy, can make us personally productive. You know, we think the way people are going to start succeeding in business is being ahead of the curve and using agents in business. But there's two very different visions. You know, one is that OpenAI and their competitors will define the agents that you use. They'll make it a closed ecosystem. They'll dictate under what terms. They'll extract increasingly all the value and surveil you along the way. That's not a future we want, right? So to me, that is the most critical fight for us to get right, is that we instead build a healthy ecosystem where the community has a stake, where that everyone has a chance to build agents that contribute and work together. So I think that's that's the urgent fight. Uh, you know, I think we can survive a while with having a, a few giant corporations training competing models, but not if they use that to lock in their advantage by uh, becoming the dominant agent provider and making them incompatible so that everyone has to submit to Google, OpenAI, or Apple's agents. So I think that's the most critical thing that we have to get right as a community. Um, I'd say the centralized AI or the closed AI world doesn't really care much about blockchains right now. Maybe they're starting to care a little bit because they're like, okay, I guess quality data does matter and I actually need to know where this data comes from and people are requiring me to do this. Um, so I think we will start to get their attention if we, what, what do they actually care about? They care about getting to AGI as quickly as possible. So is there a way for the decentralized world to get to AGI faster? Um, I think that'd be a really interesting question to answer. Also, is there a way for blockchains to actually align these hyper-intelligent models in a better way than centralized companies can? I think that's when we start getting a lot of attention from the centralized AI uh, ecosystem. And I'd say right now we're still in a phase where there's a lot of infrastructure to be built to actually be able to have those proof points. Yeah, for us, like uh, we think we need to think about what the pain points of AI developers in Web2. And I think um, by talking to a lot of AI community member and developers and researchers, uh, the right now the biggest concern is the open access to GPU compute. And that's the reason that we start with that, like we're building GPU uh, aggregation layer to aggregate global GPUs, allow people to access different GPU resources that they want. And also we host AI models, uh, which are the, like, the most uh, advanced and state-of-the-art open source AI models, allow the AI developers to access them without um, like being approved by a centralized party. Um, so at Hyperbole, we actually started building our real AI communities. Uh, we kind of have more than 100K developers registered on our platform and start using our APIs. Uh, worth to be mentioned, uh, a big figure in AI, Andre Kapathy, uh, who's the OpenAI co-founder co and like director of AI at Tesla. Uh, he shot it up on Hyperbolic, uh, about Hyperbolic on Twitter, saying that he's using API uh, from Hyperbolic to do open AI research. Uh, and uh, we started seeing more and more uh, AI developers using our uh, open source uh, API to run different AI experiments. For example, there is a research group running, uh, trying to run different AI agents to talk to each other and see what's their, con whether they have consciousness and like what is the, um, what's the, their thoughts behind the, just the languages. Um, and I think besides open access, very soon people will want to see how I can monetize the AI models. And this is how we think blockchain can come into play, which allow people, people to tokenize their access. And uh, in the future, if AGI become possible and uh, people are worried about whether the AGI will dominate the human society, then the transparency and verification will also become uh, solutions to that. Uh, which is um, another key uh, by power by blockchain. So in the case of Archeum, I think what's what's interesting, both on the artificial intelligence front, but also for general compute, 
um, the way we bring adoption to the blockchain um, is also not because we want to bring adoption to the blockchain for blockchain sake, but simply because um, powered by blockchain um, or distributed systems in, for this technology is the superior way of doing it, the um, more cost-effective, more trustless and efficient way. Um, and so for artificial intelligence, what that means is that um, for high sensitive data, um, our technology can be used for machine learning. Um, or, and I think that's interesting, completely new use cases are being enabled that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Um, and that, for example, is collaborative AI. So multiple parties with isolated, highly sensitive data being able to collaboratively train some model without ever having to expose a single bit of information to any of the other parties. Um, that's an um, val uh, incredibly valuable use case um, and is only being enabled by this technology because any other technology could have backdoors um, and, and data could be exploited. And so I think um, the way we need to approach adoption of this decentralized technology is offering more powerful um, products, more powerful technology, more powerful user experience. And so what we are trying to do is make these new kinds of use cases accessible. Um, and that's the real edge that we have at the end of the day, this um, new kind of trustless collaborative um, AI. Awesome, thank you. Uh, since we are constantly trying to have these hot takes and since Michael brought it up and did not answer. I'm curious, for AGI, who's going to reach it first, centralized or decentralized AI? <laughs> Hopefully decentralized. <laughs> I mean, I... I, I okay, you, you wanted to add to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 might, might have been a short answer. <laughs> go, go ahead, I can go after you. Okay. We've been on many panels, so... I mean, I, I, I think there's... Um, there's a certain uh, hubris uh, about how soon we're going to reach AGI. Um, certainly in the centralized AI uh, research community, which is like once I, I see a couple of things that I know I have to work on to get to AGI, I'm just about solved it, right? Like, oh, reasoning and planning, right? Those are important topics to get to AGI. Um, I think people are going to discover in, in all the research that it is many iterations to really understand reasoning and planning. And we may discover, rediscover a lot of other aspects of AI that are not easily solved and take more research along the way. So are we making significant progress in better AI? Yes. But AGI, as in, uh, just to, to be clear, as an AI that is as good as the median human at every ta every intellectual task or all important ones, um, you know I think we, we should be humble and say it may take quite a while to get that and and not believe uh, the view of those uh, at some of these labs or former lab members who think it's the median time is four years to AGI. <laughs> um, it's certainly true if the median time to AGI is four years, it will be developed in a centralized lab. But um, you know I think we can be hopeful that we have a little more time to develop and to prepare um, and to maybe have a better way of having it land than to have a handful of CEOs of private companies uh, build the sand god. Yeah, and we may discover that just basically saying like, okay, well, now we have a trillion parameter model. Okay, now 10 trillion and then 100 trillion and so on. We may discover that that doesn't lead to AGI which in that case, we then have to look at other solutions like, okay, well, what if we train you know, hundreds, thousands, you know, millions of small expert models and then put them together with middleware and then call that AGI? Well, the latter use case, actually, if you unlock all of you know, latent compute and have blockchains as coordination mechanisms, those lend themselves to a decentralized kind of superiority or winning in that context. So we'll have to see. I totally agree with the Ubers. Like, oh yeah, in four years we're going to have you know AGI, and we have to align it properly, and everybody knows that that's going to happen end of the decade, and we'll have humanoid robots running around everywhere. And so, um, future is definitely coming. But uh, I agree with the Ubers point. And I think um, in order to prevent this sort of dystopian um, vision, um, what needs to be done um, is to to be able to 
build the foundational technology and integrate this foundational technology that all of us are building and introduce it into societies, right? So the way I think about it is that um, in 10 years, um, a lot of data, a lot of um, individuals' data and AI models can be fully encrypted, yet transparency exists because of verifiability over this encrypted state. And once we've reached um, a societal level where data is secure and owned by individuals, well then creating these kind of super intelligent systems also requires the collaboration between those peers. Um, and then we are able to get decentralized um, general artificial intelligence. Totally agree with all of you guys. Um, I think the decentralized or not, like whether the decentralized AGI will happen or centralized AGI will happen first, uh, I think it also depends on everyone here. Like, let's see how how many developments that we can make in the next few years and see if we can catch up with the centralized uh, companies. I, I also want to point out, though, decentralization isn't a panacea, right? Like, there's real risks from centralized AGI but there's also real risks from decentralized AGI. Like you have to be honest and say, you have to mitigate risks wherever they come from, right? So like if you have fully decentralized AGI and no one has any control over it and there isn't good governance, that has some really bad outcomes. You know, long before you get that, if you have increasingly powerful AI, even if it's not AGI, that lets any psychopath unleash a lethal pandemic, we're all in a lot of trouble, right? And, and, and lots of other cases. If suddenly we en enable anyone, any script kitty, to become a, to, to rob, you know, billions of dollars, you know, society breaks down, right? So it's not as simple as like the, the, the evil centralized organizations need to be stopped. The evil centralized corporations do need to be stopped, but we also need to govern the decentralization. So we can't use the idea that hopefully it won't happen in the next few years that we get AGI to, uh, as an excuse to be complacent and say, there's nothing to do here. We not only need to move ahead in the, with decentralized AI, but we need to do it with the wisdom and the governance to be ready as AI gets more and more powerful and transformative. Yeah, totally agree with that point. To imagine like a North Korean AI model completely decentralized that's like taking over banking systems, not not cool. So yeah, we need to have proper governance. <laughs> so oh, um, just a quick comment. The way Ron is talking, I feel like Ron is really constructing this this army of AI agents that in the future will protect all of us. <laughs> We'd like to create an ecosystem where AI agents are pro-social and succeed by behaving well and not anti-social and succeed by cheating and breaking the rules. <laughs> we need enlightened AI, that's what we need. I'm, I'm curious, Ron, what do you think has more risks? Is it decentralized AGI or centralized AGI? I think there's big risks on both sides. Um, I, I think it's very hard to avoid the corrupting a aspect of power. So the centralization ultimately is, you know, probably a fatal risk that if we give any one person control of AGI, um, I don't see how that goes well, right? So I think decentralized is probably the lesser risk, but um, I, I think uh, there's a lot that we have to get right and it's not purely going to be a technology solution. It's also governance. And I, I, it may not be the most popular thing at crypto conferences, but I think there's still an important role for government, even though, uh, heaven forbid, I don't think government's going to develop the technology, but they still are going to play a role in governance as well as good technology and community participation. But I think that's really um, an interesting, interesting thought experiment to play with, right? So in my head, what we need at that point then really is um, a decentralized model, but this model can't be accessible to anyone, right? So it has to be encrypted in a way. It has to be functionally encrypted that access to this model um, can only be performed or under some specific algorithmic rules. Um, yeah. And we also need verifi verifiability of the whole process then. Like we need to make sure that every time when you do this decentralized training, uh, the training is, uh, we use the correct data, we don't use like those poison data, we don't follow like some specific rule, we just follow the standard training rule, et cetera. 
And I, and speaking of the governance, I think uh, maybe people can, instead of using a governance to govern the AI, you can just use a DAO and then it's voted through all of the DAO members, which is uh, probably a cool experiment to see. We are running pretty low on time, so I want to make sure that you all have enough time to give us one last hot take, if you have it. Is there anything uh, top of mind around the intersection of Web3 and AI that you have a hot take on? Not necessarily a hot take, but uh, if you want to build at the intersection, build on 0g.ai. We uh, just crossed 5 million transactions per week and have 300 projects building on top of us, so come join us. And I'd like to also give you all uh, 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 some more time to give a, a final plug, if you will. Well, I think likewise, you know, we, we're very excited about, uh, we, stay tuned. Uh, we've got some news coming up this week, but very excited uh, for the growth of the Theora community. And, you know, we think the opportunity to create great agents and use them um, is before all of us. And uh, it's a real chance to, contribute and be part of what we think is going to be absolutely the most important wave of technology in history. Yeah, we are very excited to um, finally be in the private testnet with Arcium, so developers can start um, in our private testnet to build confidential on-chain applications and confidential off-chain applications and build confidential machine learning pipelines with Arcium. Yeah, we have launched our AI Infant service for three months. And so if you're willing, you want to like try to set up uh, open source AI models, feel free to come to app.hyperbolic.xyz to try it out. We're also doing internal uh, testing uh, and like limited alpha testing for the GPU marketplace. So uh, if you want to try it out, uh, try to try train model, fine tune your model, uh, reach out to me and I can give you access. And very soon uh, we're going to launch our testnet which allow different people, uh, ev everyone around the world to uh, participate in the testnet to contribute compute and also access compute. Yeah. And I guess I'll, I'll do a final plug. So Sahara AI, our light paper actually comes out tonight at 9 p.m. Singapore time. And if you would like to join our wait list, I will be here for a few minutes. So come talk to me and I'd be happy to put you on it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. I think for all of those, yeah, I think for all of those uh, shameless plugs, we have deserved the chilies. <laughs> yeah. Well, we only have two chilies, so I guess uh, audience vote on who needs to eat them. <laughs> who, just uh, who, who, uh, who wants to eat the chilies? We have two. You got one already? We got one? I have one more. Want to try it? All right. All right. Can I slice it? Cheers. <laughs>